Hey, how's it guys? It's MJ, the Student Actuary, and in this video, I want to talk about the challenges of investing in Africa. So what I've done is I've read this paper called Investing in Africa, a Practical Perspective for the South African Institutional Investor. It's written by a company called Investment Solutions, and they're a great company. Go check, go check them out. They've got a cool YouTube channel, and what they've basically done is they've written this whole report which I've basically just taken the, the graphs and I'm going to talk around the graphs. So it's all of their work. I'm just doing some sort of commentary um, on top of it. So you can see here, these are the authors. And I mean, one of the main reasons why they say you should invest in Africa, they've, they've given the four big reasons here, is that Africa has strong growth rates. Um, it's increasing its urbanization. There's favorable demographics and there's a growing middle class. Now, what I want to do is focus more on the challenges or the risks associated with Africa. And one of the first things I just want to mention is that in Africa, it's only Egypt, Morocco, and South Africa that are considered as emerging markets. The rest of the countries in Africa are considered as something known as frontier markets, which means they're even more underdeveloped than the emerging markets. So... I thought that was that was quite interesting. Um, and yeah, yeah, we're just gonna be going through these slides which which they've made and everything, and just gonna be pointing out some interesting things. So first off, what you can see is that developing Asia has performed the best in 2013 and 2014. In second place, we do see Africa. So Africa did did come in second place. So it does provide some nice you know, returns, especially in an environment where interest rates are very low in the developed world. It's really cool that you can get some high returns by coming to Africa. Um, the other big benefit with Africa is the very low correlations. If you look in the very first column, um, even just with, say, South Africa, Morocco is only an 8% correlation with South Africa, and Egypt only has a 6%. So that is... I mean, that's really cool. It's really cool that you can find these low correlations. So in a nutshell, the, the big advantages of coming to Africa is that we offer some high returns, not the highest, Asia is still the best, but we also offer a very low correlation, although correlation tends to dissipate, you know, at extreme market events. But while everything's running smoothly, we do have some nice low correlations, introduces great diversification benefits. But what about the challenges. I think when people think of Africa, the number one problem a lot of people think about is corruption. And I think if you see here, South Africa, we kind of like, we're with the global average. We're like average when it comes to corruption. But if you look at all the countries that are really bad or have a lot of corruption, Somalia, Sudan, Chad, Burundi, Zimbabwe, Equatorial Guinea, Angola, Kenya, Nigeria, you can see they all have very, very bad corruption scores compared to say countries like Denmark, Finland, uh, New Zealand and Singapore which have like hardly any corruption. Um, another thing with with Africa is that you can see that when we look at say the bond market um, you know how much of the bond market is capitalized compared to the GDP you can see how how small we are so we have a very very small bond market. South Africa uh, you can see with government and corporate together, we're only making up 50% of our GDP. Um, now compare that to Asia, where they're at like 350%. Although I do think that number is a little bit exaggerated because it includes Japan, and Japan, you know, has got quite a crazy, uh, you know, percentage of bonds to GDP. Um, unfortunately, they didn't include America in this graph. It would have been really cool to to compare America, but interesting to see how small Africa's bond market is. Now, this does present opportunities. It means that the bond market does have room to grow. Whereas, say, Asia, yeah, you don't want to grow that bond market any more than it is there. Um, in the next slide, I just put a bunch of, well, they had a whole bunch of bonds. Uh, I went and wrote in the, the credit rating just so that I could help myself check it out. Um, interesting things to see was how much oversubscribed these things were. I mean, you can see 15 times oversubscribed in Zambia. And for you can see the yields are actually quite low considering the poor credit rating. So that I thought was quite interesting. The size of the issues are quite small and it was quite interesting to read the purpose. 
interestingly, Senegal, who had the best credit rating, had the highest yield. But then they weren't telling the people what they were going to use their bonds for. So that was a little bit dodgy, although the, even that one got a four times uh, subscription. Um, this slide over here, we're seeing which countries are seen as uh, being investment grade. So South Africa, Namibia, and Morocco are kind of like your investment grades, with Botswana being you know, quite an upper to medium investment grade. We're going to come back to Botswana a little bit later. They've got something very interesting with their stock market. But what you can see is that the rest of Africa that actually has been rated, so you can see majority of it hasn't even been rated, but that which has been rated is either highly speculative or speculative, which means it's not a very good match for your institutional investors, say pension funds, life insurers, you know, the really big, big players in the market. Um, this next slide here is looking at, say, private equity. Africa is the, the blue block, and you can see it's, it's really, really small. So private equity in South Africa is very small. Uh, the reason for this is that there's not that many private equity managers who have long track records in Africa, um, and it's just yeah, it's really difficult to do business. We're going to see a few more challenges later. Whereas if you say China, China's huge, and Latin America is also doing, doing very nicely over there. Um, next, I wanted to show you the, the amount of companies that are listed on the various stock exchanges in Africa. What you'll see is that there's not many. There's not many companies that have been listed, and that is a problem in the market. It means there's not that many sectors to choose from. Um, interestingly, Egypt, look how they had like over a thousand companies like back in 2002, and then 10 years later, they got completely wiped out. Um, I think the reason for that was like the Arab Spring, but I don't know exactly, was the Arab Spring in 2012 or 2013 or when exactly it was, but that is a big surprise how many uh, com companies got whacked off that. South Africa also saw a decline. Uh, South Africa, we've got quite strict regulations. Um, institutional investors tend to stay with the top 40, so companies actually don't find it that feasible to, to list. They rather look at private equity deals where there's just less paperwork. Um, this next graph was a little bit confusing uh, because what we got in the blue is market capitalization in 2012 and then in the green it's the growth in the capitalization. So you can see Uganda and Zambia had this massive growth but they're coming off a very, very small base. Interestingly enough, Zimbabwe had like zero growth, probably negative if this graph was showing it. Um, South Africa, you can see we are the, the biggest market uh, with capitalization. Um, although interestingly enough, Nigeria was reported to have you know, passed us last year. And if we see Nigeria at this stage wasn't actually that big, but they did have quite a nice, quite a nice growth. Also look at your countries, like I said, Morocco and Egypt, those are your merging. I think Nigeria is now considered emerging as well. I don't think it's a frontier anymore, but I do stand uh, you know, correction there. Um, if we look at stock market capitalization as a percentage of GDP, this is showing like how developed the market is relative to its size. Uh, first thing you should check out is how Zimbabwe has been absolutely smacked by a lack of leadership in their political arena. Um, so that's a very bad thing to see. Egypt also saw a little bit of a smack, but I think, like I said, that was because of the Arab Spring. I was curious as to know why Ghana decreased. I wasn't expecting that from, from Ghana. Uh, I would have expected that to increase. But you can see, otherwise, besides those countries that I've mentioned, there is a little bit of increase, except for South Africa. South Africa, I think, has, has reached that maturity. I actually consider South Africa more as a developed country than emerging, although it's kind of like a weird, it is a bit of a weird hybrid between the two. Um, if we look at annual turnover as a percentage of market capitalization in 2011, here you can see um, you know, how big South Africa is with Egypt in second place. Uh, surprising is, is Zimbabwe is still there in third. Um, it was, I really tried to find out where USA and Japan was. What this graph basically is saying is how liquid these markets are. So the one measure is to look at annual turnover as a percentage of market capitalization as an indication of liquidity. So we can see South Africa has great liquidity, Egypt has great liquidity, and Zimbabwe, funnily enough, despite his problems, still has the third best liquidity in Africa, followed by Tunisia, Morocco's there, 
Kenya, Nigeria, and then Mauritius. That's very good for Mauritius being a tiny little island. Um, their, their economy has done very nicely. Speaking of how, how economies have been doing, let's actually have a quick little look at how, how they have all been jumping around. I mean, check Egypt. Egypt did an absolute boom in like 2005. That is massive. And then it just crashed. Oh, dreadful. Um, Zambia also has been incredibly volatile. It's up and then it's down. Uh, Mauritius seems to be doing quite nicely as well. Unfortunately, they didn't show South Africa because that would have been quite a cool uh, country to compare. Um, th okay, this I just found this very interesting. These are the exchange trading times. Botswana is only open for 45 minutes. That is insane. Only 40. It's like, guys, we're going to trade. Okay, everyone, make your trade. Make your trade. Like, like you can't go to the toilet during that time because that's the only time you have all day to make your trades. Uh, I thought that was quite, quite interesting. For those of you looking at saying what is B. RVM, what that is, is that it is an exchange that has a whole bunch of countries like Ivory Coast, I think Tongo is also in it, um, a few countries around there, they use one exchange, which I think is a great idea, rather than each country having their own little exchanges, it makes sense to group them together. Um, then I looked at, a, I wanted to see why, coming back to private equity, what causes managers to stay away from certain countries. I did have to Google what MENA was, or MENA, however you pronounce that. That's Middle East and North Africa. Um, it's, it's interesting. So when you consider Africa, there's basically three parts of it. There's South Africa, which people consider by itself. Then there's Sub-Saharan Africa. And then there's North Africa, Egypt, Morocco, and Algeria, which they kind of consider more as to be the Middle East. It's, it's weird how they've done it and not just you know Africa as a continent. But interestingly... Um, Managers don't think that there's too much, too much competition in Africa. Um, they do feel that there aren't that many opportunities, that the opportunities are too small. Uh, and they, they feel like entry valuations are actually quite cheap. So I thought that was quite good. Interestingly enough, Brazil had a political risk of just 10% back in, when was this, 2013? Which, if you've been reading the news lately, you'll know that Brazil has massive political risk at the moment. So, yeah, I think the, the, big, the big things with Africa is, is this lack of liquidity. The markets are small. They're very thinly traded. It's hard to pull your money out. It's hard to put your money in, especially when you're coming in as a big boy investor of, say, an institution, um, you know, with a pension fund or something like that. The markets are too small. There's also currency volatility. I mean, the RAND experiences it as well. It's jumping all over the place. African currencies are the same. They're jumping all up around. And this introduces another risk that is not necessarily matched to your liabilities. Um, think if you're a pension fund and you're paying out in US dollars, you don't want to be exposed to all the African currencies. Uh, political uncertainty, again, that's a big one in in Africa some countries are moving towards you know better democracy but there's still poor human rights in a lot of countries there's some presidents who've been like president for 30 years you know there is like a lot of like revolutions and coups and all that type of stuff happening um, there's also a lack of transparency because a lot of these markets are quite new. Their regulations aren't necessarily up to international standards or they're written in different languages. So the transparency is still an issue in, in Africa. Um, like we said, the bond market, you know, having all of its issues, it also still has poor credit rating and is not suitable as an investment grade. Um, interestingly enough, when it comes to Africa and you want to like, let's say you invest in Africa and you're like, how did I do compared to everybody else? They don't actually have a standard benchmark. So there's a whole bunch of benchmarks, but some include South Africa, but then if they include South Africa, it makes up like 80% of the benchmark. So they take South Africa out, but then Nigeria accounts for like 50% like of the benchmark. And then some of them try to cap it and try, some of them include Egypt. Some of them are like, no, Egypt's not in Africa. And, and benchmarks are absolutely stuffed up in Africa. Like no one really knows how to measure the benchmark, which means when it comes to performance fees or seeing how you did to your competitors, it's very, very difficult. It also means a passive investment strategy is difficult to take in on Africa, which means you have to go active, which increases um, fees. But how do you work out performance fees? Oh, it's just, it's just a mess. 
there also isn't really a derivative market in Africa. There is in South Africa, but for the rest of Africa, you're kind of exposed to the currency risks and defaults and all of these type of things. Um, in your more developed markets, you know, you can just go and say, oh, I want to, you know, want these derivatives, want these little options, want these little futures, and you're all fine and everything's hunky-dory. In Africa, it's kind of still like the wild in these financial markets. You're exposed to these risks and it's very difficult to hedge them out. Um, then I just want to look at a few more challenges that the paper brought up. They you know, said poor productivity and higher labor costs. I think that's when you're comparing it to, to Asia, which has very high productivity and very cheap labor costs. Um, they said also Africa has poor public health systems, which means as an investor, you don't really want to like, be spending too much time in these African places because you could get like Ebola or these diseases and there's not really good doctors there. So it's a risk for your own personal safety when you go as an investor into these places and you do want to do that for due diligence and all of that type of stuff. There still is also a lack of education and skills development, which means if you invest in a company and it is doing well, it's very difficult for that company to grow and hire other people because there's no one really of that, that skill. So I'm hoping yeah, more and more, but th that should increase in time. People, you know, education, I think, is, is on an upward trend. Um, lack of access to finance. I mean, Africa doesn't have, you know, like in Europe, there's these massive banks that have got lots of money and they can flood the, the market with liquidity and finance all these projects. Africa doesn't really have that many big banks or access to that type of finance. Um, Africa, like I said, there's a lot of government bureaucracy and hindrances. Um, I mean, in South Africa, we have this thing called BEE, which just makes investing a lot more complicated for foreign investors. They now have to learn these new regulations and these new rules. Um, yeah, governments do make, yeah, like I said, p the political leadership in Africa is not that good and they do get in the way of business. Um, Africa is also exposed to, if interest rates would rise in the developed world, um, then that, that takes away like the whole incentive of coming to Africa. So at the moment, a lot of people are coming to Africa because it's a chance to get these high returns which they can't get in their local markets. But if interest rates increase back in their local home markets, then yeah, they're gonna be like, cheers Africa, you know, we don't need you. So that is a big, a big risk. Um, again, corruption, I've mentioned it before, but it's worth mentioning again, Africa still has corruption issues. High default risk, I mean, Mozambique defaulted on its bonds earlier this year. Ivory Coast, I think, defaulted back in 2013, around there. So, I mean, bonds are supposed to be these safe instruments and they are experiencing high defaults. And you saw that the returns, they're high, but they're not that high. I mean, it's like between 5 and 9% and, you know, these guys are actually defaulting. So, that is a risk not to be underestimated. Um, like I said, regulation requirements are a nightmare. Africa's not one country like everybody see, thinks, seems to think it is. Each country will have its own rules, its own regulations, its own languages, and to try and get around all of that or understand it, you need a lot of lawyers, and oh, it is quite quite difficult. Also, capacity constraints in the smaller markets. If you are coming in with a billion dollars and you want to invest it, you are going to be shifting the market. The market will not have capacity to take on such a big investment, which kind of then if you're an institutional investor, it doesn't really make it worth your time to just put a little bit of money into Africa, you know, seeing all the information and knowledge that you have to get around the political and economic factors affecting the local markets. Um, then you also have sector concentration. So if you do manage to get into the markets, uh, there's only like three companies really, like there's telcoms, there's minings, and there might be, I don't know, a banking share. You know, there's not that much uh, choice within these markets that you're actually getting uh, like you get in the developed markets. Developed markets, they've got so many shares. In the African markets, there's still just a few. It's just the big companies. Um, like I said, telecommunications is quite a big one. But yeah, I think, let me just nail this back in. The biggest issue, though, is the lack of liquidity. And it's a mismatch for a lot of institutional investors. And it does you know, bring in a lot of risk. Um, Liquidity, 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 if that's the one thing you remember from this video, is remember that Africa does have a liquidity problem. Anyway, I just wanted to end off this video with a little picture of Africa. Um, the paper will try to say that a misconception of Africa is that we're very commodity-based, and they're trying to show that a lot of our GDPs are made up of different things. So you can see in Egypt and Kenya and South Africa, services make up a much bigger chunk than resources, Agriculture is also important, and so is manufacturing. Um, 
in a whole bunch of these economies. But anyway, that's, that is the end of the video. We've come in at under 20 minutes. Please give me a like if you enjoyed this video, and I'll make more types of videos like this if you enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Let me say goodbye. Cheers.